with the Fountain of Life welcome, please welcome Dr. Francis Miles. Hallelujah. Come on, Fountain of Life. Give Jesus a shout in the house. Hallelujah. Wow. Listen. I travel all over the world, but this is, I feel inadequate he being here because this is one of the few times I'm preaching in a church where the pastor is more famous than me. So it's kind of, uh, you got to pray for me. <laughs> My God. You know, is this also the first time that I, the first time I saw the pastor, I, you know, I was rooting for him to die in Nashville before the cinema. I'm standing for Viola Davis because she's my girl, you see. And I'm crying from this evil man to die. And when he died, I stood up and I began to praise the Lord. And then I met him at Victoria Island. And I loved him like my, I loved him. I felt like I needed to, I said, Lord, I need to rewatch that movie again. I think I was deceived. <laughs> so it's an honor to be here. With my lovely wife, who is a, my wife is in the house, Carmela Miles. This is our very first time to Nigeria. Come on, Fountain of Life. Amen. Praise the Lord. I watched the woman of God uh, talking about, you know, the audacity of faith, uh, living in expectation. Come on, you are, come on, somebody. I was so blown away to meet her. Come and celebrate what she preached. I was like, my God, hallelujah. Jesus, help me. Oh, my God. Man, I'm sandwiched between powerful people, but, uh, but pray for me. Pray for me, Jesus. My dear friend, one of the most wisest minds I've ever met in ministry is Dr. Ola Kunle Shorian. Ah, uh, come on, celebrate. One, listen. For those who never got to meet King Solomon, Kunle is a shortcut to Solomon. It's that easy for me. I mean, it, it, and he's the most difficult person. He came to our studio in Atlanta. He's the most, you know, I've interviewed Pastor Benny Hinn and different people. He's the most difficult person to interview because you forget you're supposed to be interviewing. And on television, you are caught writing notes. Oh, sorry, come on. Oh, my God, yeah. What did we say? You know, come on, somebody. He was very challenging. You know, and so it is the reason why I met Pastor Jim, the angel of our house. Come on, give your hands for the angel, my brother from another mother. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you ready for me tonight? Amen. Are you ready for me tonight? Come on, fountain of life. Turn to your neighbor and tell them everything is about to shift. Tell your neighbor everything is about to shift. Somebody say hallelujah. Amen. Well, before we, we read our first scripture, I'm glad you're already standing because I make people stand up for the first scripture. I just want to tell you that by the special grace of God, the Lord has really anointed me to write books that are best-selling books in America. You know, oh, by the way, this ring, this lion ring uh, was given to me by my publisher uh, because they told me the last time they made so much money from a black man was Miles Monroe. And so they said they bought me a diamond lion ring and brought it in. And um, so I have books that I've written. The Joseph of Arimathea is about for those who are in business, you know, who want to know uh, how, you, how to scale the business mountain issuing divine restraining orders from the courts of heaven. Uh, the, my latest book we did with Sid Roth is following the, the footsteps of Rabbi Jesus into the courts of heaven. It's a very deep teaching on the courts of heaven from the rabbinical traditions of Jesus. The Battle of Otis that was um, autographed by my bishop, Bishop Tudor Bismarck. Uh, my book, I Speak to the Earth, Release Prosperity. Is a book everybody should get. Amen. If you're trying to own property or own property and you'd like to, uh, uh, you'd like to see God do something on the property or raise the value of the real estate, you want that book. 
Ties of honor, tithing under the order of Melchizedek is the first is the reason why Kunle brought me to she brought me to Nigeria the first time I came to Nigeria, and I'm so glad for that we met and we I, I talked to him about he came from to our church in Arizona, and we were at a, having coffee and I began to talk about the revelation God gave me on tithing under the order of Melchizedek and Kunle stopped drinking he said you need to come to Nigeria, and that began my journey to Nigeria. Uh, but my, absolutely, my best book of all times is The Order of Melchizedek. Amen? These books are available at the back. You can avail yourself to them. Man of God, I think there are books over there. Those are yours already. And I'm going to give some to Pastor Tolu. Amen? Praise God. Amen? Praise the Lord. I want everybody to, let's read, to, let's read, let's read um, a couple of scriptures together and then you're going to take your seat. We're going to go someplace, and I'm, someplace in the spirit today. Uh, my mandate is very clear, and I'm going to announce it, but I want us to read the scriptures together. So I want everybody to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, and I'm using the New King James Version of the Bible. The New King James Version of the Bible. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, and then we're going to jump to the version chapter 4. Verse 1 to 5, I want to read a couple of things with you while you're standing. And then we're going to tie them together in a, in a ball of revelation that's going to make sense and explode into powerful manifestations of the Spirit of God. So Hebrews chapter 4, one verse only. Verse 14, amen. 1, 2, 3, read. Saying there that we, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Amen? Amen? Now we move to the book of Revelation, chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. Revelation, chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. 1 to 3, read. After these things I looked, and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I'll show you things which must take place after this. Verse 2, immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like Jasper, is, is that right? And the sat your stone in appearance and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Verse 4, Around the throne we had 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Verse 5, and from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy, chapter 6, 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. Are you there? 1, 2, 3, read. Which he will manifest in his own time, he who is the blessed and only potent, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality dwelling in an approachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Now, the last scripture I want you to look at, then the others I'll touch them as I go by myself. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I want you to turn in your Bibles now to Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1 to 5, and then you can take your seat. And we're going to be flying tonight. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, okay. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1 to 5. Then he opened the seven sea. One, two, three, read. When he opened, Revelation chapter 8 from verse 1 to 5. Let's read it together. One, two, three, read. When he opened the seven seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the angels who stand before God. And to them were given 
seven trumpets. Verse 3, another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Verse 5. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it into the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Say with me. He took fire from the altar and threw it into the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. Believe you me, that scripture will become the argument of the night. I believe that, I believe that God wants to do a lot with us. And I believe tonight God is going to add another dimension to what's been happening at, the word, at this word, of ex, word explosion. And what I am, I'm hoping tonight by the Spirit of God to explore inside of you is a new understanding of the altar. There will be a new understanding of the life of the altar. Because I feel like in Africa, the understanding of the altar is cured by our own fears of the traditional altars that we are dealing with in our culture. And so I want to be able to bring another, another perspective, another, 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 another perspective to the subject of the altar that I believe are going to activate us, are going to activate many of the people who have come to the word of explosion in, all, in ways you never even thought were possible. So I want everybody to just pray with me right now. Father, I thank you for this anointing. I thank you for what you have, what, what you have put upon my spirit, the way that I bring to the house. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I give you all the praise and all the glory. But let there be an explosion of destiny. Let there be an explosion of new mantles, new destinies. Let there be an explosion of new products that will come from this house. And take over the Nigerian and the global marketplace. And people will say I, the product was birth. The company was born at Word of Explosion. In the name of Jesus. We thank you and we give you praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to take your seat. God bless you. In the next few minutes that I have. Amen. I want to talk to you about. I want to talk about. The mystery of the priesthood, the altar, and the dynamics of the lifting of men. The priesthood, the mystery of the priesthood, the altar, and the dynamics of the lifting of men. But I'm going to focus more on the altar because I want to give you a different perspective on the altar. Because one of the things God spoke to me, is said to me, Francis, I want you to activate marketplace, marketplace altars at widow explosion. But I really believe that the altar message is bigger than we have understood it in the continent of Africa. That it's very practical to the things we are dealing with. You know, and so I want to be able to come from a different perspective. Because much of what we understand about altars in Africa is, uh, I mean, sometimes is, is tempered or sometimes compromised by the altars we are fighting within our culture. If you live in Africa, the subject of altars is not going to be a strange subject to you because the African consciousness grows around the issue of altars. We are, from the time we are children, some of us are raised, are raised in houses where the reverence for evil altars is paramount. Before we, even, we, we ever even have a chance to meet God, our consciousness is so taken over by a warped understanding of the altar from the, different, from the other kingdom. That by the time we come into the kingdom of God, much of how we behave around the altar or we think about the altar is tempered by our reaction to the altars in our own culture. You know, I remember, you know, I remember one time I was having a conversation with, with Kunle and we're laughing, we're talking about and we're saying, you know, Africa, I remember there was a time when, uh, 
you know, I think what we, are, we, are, we, are, we were, uh, we were, my mother was trying to impress upon me. She wanted me to be afraid of witchcraft. And so being a mother, you know, she, uh, she embellished her story. She said, son, you've got to be careful. Africa is, full, Africa is full of witches. So, it, it, but I was born with an inquisitive mind. I mean, instead of being afraid, I, I became inquisitive. I wanted to know more. And then she, she, and she, said, she said, Francis, the witches in our country are so powerful. They can rise on a broom and just disappear through the wall and do all kinds of things. And she told me that. You know, and I was blown away. I said, really, mama? I said, oh, I'm telling you. They can just, you know, you, one moment they are before you, they just disappear. And the next moment they have appeared in another city. They are doing all kinds of mayhem. So I need you children to be very careful around certain people because there are some witches in your family. So uh, two days later I came back. I said, Mother, that witchcraft talk, I'm thinking about it. I said, what, what are you thinking about? I said, if we have witches who can fly and disappear, why has our government not enlisted them in the military? Because as a strategy, these are the kind of people <laughs> I would be looking for <laughs> in the military. I began to think, my, my wife said, my mama said, ah, shut up. That's not what I, that is not what I was trying to communicate. I bring up that point is because I, when we talk about altars in the African context, a lot of times the people who teach us, now, now do I believe in altars? I believe in an altar. This is an altar. Altars are, are in, inescapable within the economy of glory. But, but, but I'm, I'm realizing as I travel the nations, particularly uh, that, uh, 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 the, the more time I spend in the African continent, that if we are not careful, our, our uh, consciousness around the altars in Africa and what they can do can marginalize how we are, can marginalize or compromise our divine ordinations in the marketplace. So that when we arrive in the marketplace, marketplace we are disadvantaged because we are arriving. Uh, we are arriving in the marketplace with a warp, with a with a, a very warped understanding of the altar, as if the altar was the devil's idea in the first place. So I want to really bring up the altar from a marketplace understanding because God wants me to activate. I'm an apostle to the marketplace. You know, I am a pastor, but I love my all things marketplace. God, I believe that if we are going to change Nigeria, if we are going to change, talk to me somebody, America, it just can happen from ecclesiastical anointings. I believe there has to be, there has to be a rising of the critical mass of men and women discovering their divine ordinations within the congregation and beginning to do signs and wonders that don't look like Benny Hinn, but they are signs and wonders in their own atmosphere. Are you catching what I'm saying? There are signs and wonders in their own atmosphere because they are produced by the same altar, but the altar is manifesting differently for different people because of the divine ordination that is in your life. And that's what I want to work on. I want to show you because the altar is such a powerful uh, instrument that God designed. But in order for us to understand the altar, you alter and then apply it in very practical ways so that in our lives it can help us explode and rise out of the uh, rise out of whatever we're going through you know because when i read the bible here's what i find that the way the by the guys in the bible approached the bible the altar was very practical for them you know when jacob had when jacob was losing uh, to laban it was the his understanding of the altar that changed the dynamics of his business connection with laban he actually comes and talks about how that altar that he built to the Lord at Bethel was, how, what, was what God used as a point of contact to give him a business idea that changed how he dealt with Laban. So that by the end of the day, uh, Jacob has become more richer than his employer. I believe we are coming in times like that, 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 that God is going to begin to move in our lives in such a way that, that we're going to begin to become richer than the people that employed us. If we understand the dynamics of the altar and how, it, it, how the altar manifests itself in different people. 
because of different divine ordinations. So I want to go into that. So God began to talk to me. He said, Francis, in order for my people to fully appreciate the power and the dynamics of the altar, you must understand the altar not from the perspective of survival where Yes, yes, you need, the, yes, you know, where you go to the altar because you want God, you want God to deal with the warfare that you are dealing with. Can altars deal with warfare? Yes, they can. But God says before there was any kind of warfare, the altar existed before the fall of Lucifer and the altar existed before the fall of man. So if the altar existed before the fall of Lucifer, talk to me somebody. And if the altar existed before the fall of Adam, then the altar has to have applications that have nothing to do with survival. Talk to me, somebody. Then the altar, talk to me, somebody, has to have other applications, you know, that are more dynamic, more powerful than just surviving. You know, the, the altar, if the altar, because I could understand, when I was studying the subject of altars, I could understand altars on earth. And because we are, in a, we are living in a broken down world. We are dealing with all kind of warfare coming from every side. So I can understand altars on the earth. You know, I can understand altars on the demonic world because people are using them to engage the demonic, to get whatever benefits they think they can get by engaging the satanic that way. I can understand altars in the, in the, in the natural realm even from the, from the side of the sense, because we're trying to engage an extraordinary God to be able to get involved in the affairs of our lives that many times are beyond our capacity to, to change. But what began to really get to me is I cannot understand why there would be altars in, the, in, the, in heaven. Why would heaven need altars? Why would heaven need altars? Because heaven is perfect. As a matter of fact, you know, you know because the altars, the altars were in heaven long before Lucifer fell. So it's not the fall of Lucifer that caused God to come up with the idea of the altar. And so I, as I began to ask that, the Lord spoke to me. And he said to me, he said to me, Francis, the altar is very important. When you understand the altar, you are going to begin to understand that there is no way, by me, there is no way for, there is no, absolutely no way for, for divine interaction, divine interactions between God and creation unless the altar facilitates it. But why? Why would the altar be needed as a platform of facilitating divine encounter? Because without, without exception, any man in the Bible that was ever raised by God, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you can go down the line. Every man that God was, ra was raised by God had to, deal, had to have an altar. Every one of them without exception. But yet in heaven we also see altars. Why do we need altars in heaven? Can I have a chair? I want to demonstrate something. I want to show you something about the altar. And then I want to bring it to a marketplace. I want to, I want to bring it into a marketplace framework. Framework so you can begin to understand what the altar will look like for you because we're going to go into a time of activation at the end of my teaching. God wants me to activate the, your altar in the marketplace. That the altar in the marketplace will begin to talk to you in ways you've never heard God speak to you before. And so now, thank you, sir. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. How you, and the Lord spoke to me. He says, Francis, the re, watch this. The reason why your altars are important, the reason why altars are important even in heaven, and then they were transferred to the earth, because God has to engage the earth realm the same way he is engaging heaven. Why would angels need altars? And he said to me, Francis, because here's the, here's the thing, the main reason why altars become important in heaven is because even though God made heaven, he is not contained by it. God created heaven but does not live in it, but manifest himself in it. Because watch this. Heaven cannot contain God because how can the one who made something be contained by it? The reality is this. The reality is this. The Bible says, and God, is that right? Is that right? The Bible says, and God created, is that right? The heavens and the earth. So the question that comes to mind is, where was God before he made anything? Heaven could not have been his container because it came out of God. 
Is that right? So heaven comes out of God. It, you know, and so God cannot be contained by what he made. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, Solomon says it this way. In, I'm, I'm ready to read you the scripture. Uh, Solomon says it this way in, in uh, the book of First Kings, chapter 8, 20, chapter 8 and 27. He says, but God will indeed, but, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? This is the question that Solomon, who achieved realms of wisdom by divine ordination, that none of us will ever be able to touch. It is Solomon who is asking the question, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold heaven and, behold heaven and, behold heaven and the highest heaven, that means the third heaven cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. So Solomon understood, Solomon understood that even though God, God's presence manifests on a very higher level in heaven, he is not contained by it. He is beyond it. And, and so if God is not, is beyond the third heaven itself, where where is where, where is where is the where is the godhead uh in other words, where was the godhead where where was the godhead before they made heaven and earth according to paul paul is saying god dwells in approachable light in approachable light means that god the the, the, the godhead before they made everything that could be known they only existed as the three father son and the holy ghost in a ball of light and energy, so much energy that if God does not reduce that energy, no creature can know him. So that in order for God to be known, talk to me somebody, in order for God to be known and to engage the creatures that he creates, he has to reduce the level of energy that he has. Because if God, if all of God, his very essence, uh, if, if, if God's very essence came into heaven or came into earth, the whole place would explode because God has so much energy. So what, you know, in electricity, if a transformer has got so much energy and you want, that, you want the appliances to enjoy the benefit of the, of the energy or the electricity, there is a thing called an adapter. What the adapter does is that it takes the energy coming from uh, uh, the power source and lowers it down so that what passes through the other side is palatable and usable by the end user. Otherwise, if you don't have something, if the power coming from a power source is higher than what my, my laptop can, con can contain, what's going to happen is this appliance will always explode at the point of impact with the energy from the source. Therefore, the, therefore, at that level, the power coming from the source is not usable because it can be mitigated for it to be able to fit the appliance that is attached to it. So now, God said to me, the altar, the altar serves that same purpose in the economy of glory. That when you are before the altar, when you are before the altar, God can, uh, when you are before the altar, God can dynamically send to you aspects of himself at the level that you can handle it where you are. And as you grow in grace, God can send you more. But there can't be a direct contact. You need something that lowers it down. So the altar now becomes a place of engaging God, you know, engaging God so that what you're receiving is exactly what is usable on your end. Now, where am I going with this? I'm saying this. So the altar now becomes a place of exchange, you know. It's a place of exchange. It becomes a place where humanity meets with divinity, including the angels. You know, it becomes a place of exchange because in God, there is so much he wants to release. Talk to me, somebody. You know, but through the altar, you know, but the altar God created, this God created is dynamic. Right now, right now, everybody is very excited about AI, you know, artificial intelligence. But do you know what's higher than artificial intelligence is DI, divine intelligence. So the altar, talk to me somebody, is built, God built the altar as a technology of engaging creation. 
So it can enjoy creation. Creation can enjoy the different nuances of who God is without exploding. For instance, the sun is great, but I'm too happy it's millions of miles away. Because any closer, we fry. So now the sun at that level is not usable to us because the energy destroys us before we can enjoy it. The reason you can go and bask in the sun is because God made sure its, it's energy levels are far away from you to where by the time it gets to you, what you are getting is the enjoyable part of the sun. But so now when you come to the altar now, different, now, now when you notice something, uh, that the, on the throne, the Bible talks about there were different uh, different um, uh, stones, emeralds, uh, different things. And when the light of God comes, the different uh, crystals who make different lights or different nuances of the same glory of God, so that every, every, every people looking at the same, the same, same image, somebody will see uh, this different aspect of God, somebody will see something different. What this applies to in the marketplace is this, and this is what I want to get to, is this. That every child of God, without exception, is called to be a priest. You are called to be a priest. Being a lawyer, being a doctor, does not excuse you from priesthood. Because priesthood is the number one calling of every believer. If you are a consultant, you are a priest. If you are a mother, priesthood is in your DNA. It is the highest calling of the believer is priesthood. Someone say priesthood. Each one of us are called to be what? A priest before the Lord. Is that right? But notice now, a priest, uh, but now, now, what makes the, what makes, but, but, but what makes the priesthood of every believer dynamic is how, the, is how the altar engages them based upon the divine ordination they are carrying. So now, here's what it means. It means this. That it means that if you are, if by divine ordination, you are called by God to be a clothing designer. Talk to me somebody. The altar, when you come before glory and God begins to ex make exchanges with you through the altar, he's not going to begin to show you blind eyes opening because that's not useful to your design. S talk to me somebody. So we have people now who are clothing designers. They, have been, they were ordained, anxioned by God to bring the next designs to the world. They are ordained to clothe the world. And in clothing the world, they'll make millions of dollars that will help the church advance the kingdom. But the problem is they are, every teaching they have about altars is taught by men on pulpits who use the altar for what they need it to produce miracles, signs, and wonders. But what is the clothing designer trying to do competing with Benny in. That is a misappropriation of the altar. Because for you, the altar must make you make dresses that will make Louis Vuitton fly on private jets to Fountain of Life looking to talk to you. Talk to me somebody. Are you with me somebody? Talk to me somebody. Listen to me. If your divine ordination is to be a, is a neurosurgeon, then your interactions with altar cannot look the same as cannot look the same as the man who's caught to a deliverance ministry. In other words, if you're a neurosurgeon, listen, if you're a neurosurgeon and somebody has a brain tumor, the way the altar wants to engage you in that space, as you interact with the Lord as a priest at the altar of your marketplace calling. Is God will show you new templates, new modalities of treatment. Can I talk to you? New modalities of treatment the world has never seen, which will show to the world the manifold glory and wisdom of God. The reason why our God is marginalized in society is because we all give God one face. In the church, our God is one face. So when we talk about signs and wonders, we just mean, we just mean blind eyes opening. So everybody in the church is a Donald Bunky now. Everybody in the church is a Benny Hinn. And God said, no, you are misappropriating the economy of glory. Because you don't understand. If you are called to be 
the next, if you are called from fountain of life to be the next Steven Spielberg, when you engage altar, it won't show you blind opening. It will show you movie scripts the world has never seen. Because God inevitably wants to show his handiwork in that space. So God can dominate it, take it over through his children who are engaging priesthood by altar, but the altar is coming to them based upon divine ordination. Notice now that when, when King Solomon deals with altar, he doesn't tell him about deaf ears opening. As a matter of fact, when Solomon deals with the altar, God comes and tells them, because I've, I've given you a wise and discerning heart. Why is that an important manifestation of altar to him? Because he was in government over people. And he needed to know how to run the affairs of the state. Can you imagine if a president comes here and you are expecting an economic policy because the country is in trouble. And he says, last night I prayed for somebody. Come on, somebody. Two blind eyes open. And there was a woman on a wheelchair. People of, people of Nigeria. She came off the wheelchair. Ah, You'll be like, Mr. President, we appreciate that. But Nigerian currency is acting funny. So I came to hear your answer on the economy. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I didn't. Why? Because if I want to hear a blind eyes open, I've got Dr. Paul Eneche. If I want to hear a blind eyes open, I can go and talk to, talk to me somebody. I can go on YouTube and watch Benin do it. But I want to hear a leader of my country tell me how is this inflation going to disappear? Now if the leader of your country is a believer, he ought to come with a strategy by altar that says when I was praying, this is how what God showed me. One, two, three things. We do this, we change the economy. Because that is how the altar, that's the kind. See, the altar, the exchanges of the altar are by design, designed to fit your divine ordination. But we have not been taught like that on altars. We have cookie cutted altars into one space. And because we have done that, Guess what? We end up glorifying witchcraft and putting it at a level that is at a level it does not even deserve. Because if our witchcraft in Africa was so powerful, how, we were, how were our witches and sangomas and doctors colonized by blue-eyed boys with cigars and a handgun for 60 years? Even the village, even the medicine man in your village was a slave. Come on. The white boy. Yes, yes, master. Yeah, all that witchcraft. A five, ten year old white boy is telling you, move. Come on, somebody. I'm here to prophesy that beginning tonight and tomorrow, many of you, when you go before the Lord, talk to me, somebody. Your altar will begin to re engage with you. And the, and the blueprints you are going to begin to see are going to reshape a new Nigeria. There is a man, a black man in America called George Washington Carver. During the days of slavery, he was the only black man that the Congress, a racially divided Congress, he was the only one they were asking to come. And he, he became an attaché, an advisor to every American government on agriculture. Why? Because when George Washington Carver would pray, the altar, because he was an agriconomist, every time he would pray, he would see different uses of the peanut. Now, if that is Africa, I rebuke this witchcraft. Who needs peanut? Now today, George Carver, the George Carver estate owns 1,000 patents. 1,000 patents to how you can use the peanut. That means every time you use one of those methodologies, guess whose royalties you are paying? A dead man. Because when his altar was, a, when he was, a, when he was engaging God as a priest, the altar was reacting to him dynamically to his divine ordination. This is why many of you are becoming spectators in the house of God because the truth is your altar is not working. 
So you come to the house of God to admire those who are talking about big things happening. Talk to me somebody, amen? Big things happening. But you realize that signs and wonders, which is the theme of our conference, can come in multiple ways. Listen to me. There was a time when for a long time, they never believed in America, in the world, in the scientific community. They did not believe that Siamese twins could be separated. It was dogma in the, edu in the medical journals, even of John Hopkins, until a black man called Ben Carson, who had an altar, showed up in pediatrics. It was a law, an established dogma. If your child was a Siamese twins, a Siamese twins are twins that were born where the brain is joined. So, medical science said, this is death on arrival. So every Siamese twin died until a, si until a German family with a Siamese twin were sent by the Lord to look for Ben Carson. At first he tried to refuse, I can't do this. He tried to go by the dogma of the day. But he said, then I went and prayed. And while he engaged the altar of prayer, he began to see a new modality of surgery, neurosurgery, that had never been done. He owns every method of doing it. And he became the first man to what? To separate Siamese twins, two brains, to separate them with such intricacy. When both children were separated, they went on to live a full life without one being crazy or the other one losing anything. How do you call that? It's called, it's called medicine by altar. And yet in our churches, talk to me somebody, are we teaching our doctors how altar looks to them in their space? What about our school teachers? Are we teaching them our altar who create new blueprints of education in terms of prayer? Because why would God, if you're an educator, talk to me somebody, amen? What is it going to help your students if God tells you there are five marine spirits in, a, in, in the Nile River? Hey, there are five. Yeah, there are five now. There are five. There are five marine spirits. They live under the water somewhere there near, near the guy in Cairo. How does that revelation change the template of, your, of the people you are educating? But that's the church now. But I'm telling you, God is here with a plumb line because many of you are going to be activated. Many of you are going to be billionaires because your altar will begin to speak. See, the, what happened, Brother Kunle, is our people know the language of the altar. The, the, the people are trying to interpret the language. They are trying to force the language of another man's altar on their own. And they are destroying the technology. Because my, because my brother and my sister, if you are not Abraham, the altar will not talk to you as though you are Abraham. It will talk to you within your own space. It will talk to you. This is, it's not by accident that you have a church with a man of God who was involved in a blockbuster. Do you know what, do you know what it takes to, to make a blockbuster a movie in Hollywood? They come once in a lifetime. What do you think God's doing? God was projecting your pastor to the young people who think the employment will only come from waiting for the government in Nigeria to act. No, my friend, you can be employed by altar if you understand how it speaks to you within your design. I was in Zimbabwe and, and uh, come on somebody, hallelujah. Are you liking this? And I found a young man, uh, uh, Pastor, Pastor Tom Duchel, a friend of mine, he took me, said, Dr. Mars, you're going to see a sign I wonder. I want you to see a boy. He said, scientists are flying in with private, including the Pentagon. So what? So yeah, he's come up with technologies of um, a renewable, renewable energy that literally has been, they are, he said, it's, a, it's the greatest thing you've ever seen. He said, people, one one, one engineer from MIT came and said, after meeting the boy, he said, the formula you use here 
We have only imagined it was possible, but we didn't know, we didn't know how to complete it. How did you complete it? He says, Jesus would appear to me in my, in my room. When I'm praying, you, you will, I'll pray, pray, pray in tongues. And then he would enter. He said, okay, stop praying. It's my time for me to teach you uh, aerodynamics, engineering. He says, I went to. He was, he never had a paper. But here was the Pentagon flying from America to see a 21-year-old Zimbabwean boy. How do you figure that out? Because his altar, he found the language of his altar. I don't know who I'm talking to today. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. Man, listen. If your child is going to be the next Lionel Messi, don't try to make him a preacher. More people know Lionel Messi than most pastors, I'm telling you right now. God said to me, talk. He said, I'm sending you. Because tonight is a night of activation. He said to me, the church you are going to is a church of gifted people. But, most, but some of the gifts have been buried. But he says, when, I act, when you activate them, you're not just activating new futures, new destinies. He said, Francis, you are going, there's going to be a wave of finance to this church like you have never seen. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. I mean, how do you, how do you work, how do you work, how in God's name do you work for a boss who's mean, lies, cheats, like Laban, and end up owing more, owning, owning more things than him? How do you do it? He tells us, he tells us, let me read it. Somebody pray in tongues right now if you believe, if you are receiving this. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah, come on, fountain of life. Something supernatural is happening. Something supernatural is happening. Hallelujah. There are new blueprints being handed off. I mean, if you are an architect, if you are an architect, if you are an architect, why should your author be talking to you about seven steps to the anointing? I know it's great, but as a practical matter, if, the, if God gave you a design of a building, the world has never seen, you'll be on CNN. How did a man from Nigeria build a building like this? First and foremost, uh, uh, engineering-wise, it's not possible, but it's standing. And before you know it, you are being featured everywhere, and before you know it, money is, is, is running into your hands like a puppy. Why? Because when you went to pray, the engagements of priesthood between you and the altar are coming away, are coming to you in your own space. I'm not saying there are not areas of commonality where we can, we can engage God in worship and all of that. Those are areas of commonality. But my friends, if we're going to change Nigeria, we, gotta, we can't all be the same. If we're going to change Nigeria, we, you know, we need two or, two or three Elon Musk to rise from Fountain of Life. We need the next Facebook to come out of Fountain of Life. Talk to me somebody, amen? We need the next medicines to come out of Fountain of Life. Can you believe that? Can you receive it? We need new banking systems, talk to me somebody, to come out of Fountain of Life. And you can say, you know what? Uh, uh, you know, guess what? We begin to have those type of signs and wonders and they become common you'll be surprised how many people you attract. I still believe in miracles. I still believe. Now, because I'm an evangelist, my altar as an evangelist appears to me, you know, in terms of signs and wonders because when you're an evangelist and you got people in front of you, you better work some miracles or the crusade is over. So when we do crusades, we, we do blind eyes, all kind of stuff. Yeah, because I need it. But my God, when, if you are a kunle and you got world leaders who need strategy coming to you, telling them about how many blind eyes people saw doesn't help Bill Gates. He's looking for strategy. And so you're the altar for PK comes to him in strategy. I've never seen a man who can take you in five minutes, give you a strategy, and I say, come on, kunle. 
you know, you know, when somebody's operating in their space by altar, they'll make you look stupid. Because they're able to do things in five minutes that you've been praying about for months. The red is. There it is. I believe. Let me, read, let me read one scripture and then I'm going to pray for you because I really believe God wants to activate marketplace altars in the house. Someone say marketplace altars. And trust me, in my book, The Battle of Altars, I don't, I mean, this is Africa, so I want to know, so I encourage you. Uh, you know, yeah, I talk about altars. I, I talk about marine spirits and all that stuff. <laughs> For those of you who wanted to hear that, to be encouraged. <laughs> oh, I feel good about that. You know, but what I'm saying, that in the context of this assignment, the Lord spoke to me, because I asked the Lord, what kind of church am I going to? And, he, and you know what he told me? He used one word, gifted one. He said, you are going to a, a gifted church. But some of the gifted people are operating in the shadows because they are trying to be, they are trying, they are trying their priesthood to be so like somebody they admire who is doing it in their space. And the altar is manifesting for them in their space. Trust me. You know, I have the privilege of spending time interviewing people like Benny Hinn. You know, and other men. Spend time with Dr. Miles Monroe. But I'm telling you, you know, as powerful as, I mean, I'm, I can say this publicly because you probably, as powerful as Pastor Benny Hinn is in the healing anointing. He would tell you, if you went to him, to the, uh, Pastor Benny, can you give me a strategy for my business? And he said, no, brother, that's not me, brother. Oh, brother, that's not me, brother. But if you want the anointing, the anointing, I will show you how to get the anointing. And it's not wrong. That's how his altar manifests in his space. But if you need strategy, then you need to identify a gift whose priesthood and altar manifest in strategy. Or otherwise, you're going to die for the lack of strategy. So I'm going to read you a scripture, and then we're going to stand up and pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Are you receiving this? Look at Jacob. Look at Genesis 31. Genesis 31. Let me just read it. Um, you don't have to read it with me. I'm just going to read it for you. And then we're going to stand up and pray together. We're going to pray in here, because I want to activate, you know, this place. I want to believe that, you know, I want to believe that this church is gifted enough to create a whole new film industry in Nigeria. I believe that this church is gifted enough. Talk to me, somebody. Amen. That if one of the people here wrote a, a movie script that Hollywood cannot resist, your faster is already connected. Talk to me, somebody. Amen. Are you guys what I'm saying? But you can't expect him to take a, a movie script to Viola Davis where your, your movie script goes like this. Once upon a time, long, long time ago. But if, if those assignments begin to manifest themselves in the house because people are engaging priesthood from its different marketplace angles. And that's what I'm, different marketplace angles. Then my God, what can we become? What can we do for each other? So I want to read a scripture, Genesis 31, verse 4 to 13. 1, 2, 3, read. Oh, no, I'm going to read it for you. <laughs> From verse 4 to 13, but you can look at it. And I'm going to end with this scripture. We're going to pray up together because I want to really activate. I want to give the Lord, you know, I don't believe because I'm a man, of, I mean, I'm a man in signs and wonders, so I don't believe in just teaching it and not demonstrating, not allowing God to activate at least something supernatural because I don't know who is in here. And I don't know what God's going to begin to show you from today. But I pray that may that vision of a new era never leave you until you become it. And then one day you come to a weird explosion driving a Bentley. Ha! Ah, people are like, how are you driving a Bentley? He says, the last word of explosion. Amen. I went home and this is what I saw. And I've been working on that design. I just sold my design for a million dollars. So I just bought the Bentley just to appreciate myself. Talk to me, somebody. Hello? Look at this. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field, to his flock, and said to them, I see your father's countenance. 
that is not favorable towards me as before. But the God of my father has been with me. Now he's about to tell you how he has been with him. And you know, you know that with all my might, I have served your father. Yet your father has deceived me and changed my, my wages ten times. How many think this guy needed an altar that can defeat this spirit in the marketplace? Seven times. He's ten times. But God did not allow him to hurt me. If he had said thus, the speckled shall be all your wages, then all the flocks both speckled. And if she said thus, the streakled shall be your wages. Then all the flocks bore straight. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and gave them to me. But you're going to find out it is by altar that this was coming. Because God re-engaged this boy to a life of altars when he got to Bethel when he was running away from Esau. God intercepted him at Bethel to connect him to the altar Abraham built so he could, live by, he could live life by altar. Now as soon as it was activated, the altar began to come to him in, in his own space so he can dominate in his own space. No matter what happens. So if the currency goes south, you cannot kill a man who's prospering by altar. Because the altar is dynamic enough to make up for the change in the currency. Talk to me somebody. It's called being dynamic. You know, the GPS, uh, uh, how many have ever been led anywhere by a GPS? Even when you miss your route, you never uh, start calling the intercessors to pray. Fountain of life intercessors, I just missed my turn. Please pray. Have the mothers praying. They'll, say, they'll just say, shut up. Do you have Google Maps? Because we shouldn't waste in our prayers when Google Maps can take care of our time. Put Google Maps, it will bring you back home. It's dynamic. Alters are dynamic to their, <laughs> your situation, your, your, your divine wiring. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. Now it happened as the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream. Now here he goes, that's how he came. And behold, the rams which leaped upon the flock were speckled. speckled. Notice God never showed him eyes of the blind and wheelchairs getting empty. Because it means nothing to his space. It's a miracle in a different setting. In my state, I'm losing in the livestock market. I need the altar to put me back in a place of dominion. So God gives them a vision related to his assignment and his ordination. You know, verse 11, Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on the flocks are strict, speckled, and grace spotted. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. Verse 13, now here it goes. I am the God of Bethel. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed or you built an altar. Where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, go out of this land and return to the land of your family. Hallelujah. Saints, how we are using altar is making us, is killing us into oblivion. Then we are frustrated. Why is this not happening? And God says, no, it should have happened years ago. It should have happened last year when I began to show you these blueprints, but you kept attacking them because you wanted me to talk to you in a language of some sp whatever. You're missing what God wants to give to you. University students, I pray while you are in school. Talk to me, somebody. Amen? May God begin to appear to you. May, you. may your priesthood and the altar come together and synchronize around your divine ordination. Because ultimately, it is your divine ordination. Talk to me, somebody. If the movie script or the part of the movie that was given to Pastor Jim was given to me, I would have embarrassed the entire Africa. You would have actually said, we, we reject him, he's not an African. We don't even want to know what. You know, there are some people, they perform so bad, you want to be, <laughs> ah, I don't know them. You know? It didn't come to me because that's not how my, that's, that's not how my altar is designed. 
But his is designed that way. And I'm telling you, I'm prophesying to you, there's a bigger movie coming for your pastor. A bigger one. Bigger, bigger, bigger from Hollywood. Let's stand up and pray. Let's pray in tongues. Let's pray in tongues. Right? Let's pray in tongues right now. Karaba Shata. I want to activate something. Karabo Kata. Come on, somebody. Inderebo Shatalaba. Mandaraba Katerebe. Iraba Katarabo Kate. Now listen, if you are a, a minister of deliverance, for instance, then your altar, it will be dynamic to that ordination. So when you begin to pray and touch God, God will show you methods of deliverance of people. People have never seen so they're delivered like that. I understand it because I'm a means of deliverance. What I'm saying is, we need to understand that the altar cannot be cookie cutter. The altar is dynamic. It's a dynamic technology. That God designed for human engagement. So every human being can engage God upon their divine, based upon their divine ordination and get results powerfully and become influential powerfully. Have you noticed that in terms of influence, they are, they are influential preachers, but they are also influential businessmen, is right? And then they are influential doctors, is right? Then they are influential journalists. The point is influence responds to divine ordination. And it makes space for everybody. That your story can be told and your dominion can be felt in your space. Lift your hands and pray in tongues. Sakata. <laughs> Bakandara bakandere be katara baba. Shatara bakandere be de be. Eba say, Ota, Ota, Ota. Say it one more time. Ota, Ota, Ota. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, here at Word of Explosion 2024, I am asking you, in the name of Jesus, to synchronize me to the language of my altar based upon my divine ordination so I can rise I can dominate in my space in the name of Jesus Lord I declare today my marketplace altars are activated in the name of Jesus they are activated for dominion in Jesus name by next year explosion, 2025, I'll rise up in the economic scale. I'll rise up in the, on the ladder of success. I'll, be, I'll rise up in influence by the power of my divine ordination. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, give God a shout. Come on, give God a shout. Thank you fountain of life church remember you are a gifted people you are a gifted people go and release your gifts some of you are soccer stars go and do it hallelujah some of us some of you will be playing in the nba go and do it you are a gifted people hallelujah so i think i declare and decree that your giftedness is released to another dimension your giftedness is released to another dimension. Somebody shout, Jesus! Still doing it, still doing it, still doing it.